Yeah, so as Brendan said, I work on JS Next. Um, so uh, today I want to talk about modules. I, we, we work on a lot of stuff for JS Next, and I'm happy to talk with people about any of it. But, uh, but for today, I want to I wanna talk about modules, because I think it's really important. So, um, so modules are all about great libraries. And uh, uh, a language is, is really nothing without its libraries. It's, it's the lifeblood of a language. And um, uh, JavaScript is, is doing well for libraries. We've got, we've got an impressive field, uh, and it's growing all the time. Uh, it's exciting to see. I think um, uh, it's only getting better. But um, if we're really honest with ourselves, we have to admit that we're kind of getting pummeled by our older siblings. Uh, so this guy over here, uh, as of this morning, they're up to 22,529 packages on CPAN. Uh, this guy over here is c uh, closing in on 14,500 packages uh, for Python. Um, and of course, he wasn't in the original picture, but this guy is actually the, the big heavyweight here uh, as of this morning. Ruby gems are up to 23,501. Um, those are, those are impressive numbers, but I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to, to reach those numbers ourselves with JavaScript. I mean, we've got the whole web behind us, so it's not like we're talking about a small playing field. Um, so I want to argue that the language is actually not quite giving us the tools that we need to, uh, to support it. Now, on the server side, we're, we're catching up. So we're sort of, we're still the little brother, but... Uh, but NPM is, is catching up fast. I think we're closing in on about 2,000 packages for NPM. So that's, that's getting better. Um, but especially when you're talking about writing a library for the browser, um, or even worse, if you're trying to write a library that works in, in any environment that's, that's agnostic about its host environment, um, the language isn't really helping you right now. So JavaScript kind of hands you this, this little ball of clay. And uh, it's a very malleable ball of clay. We've, we've actually uh, figured out how to do a lot with this ball of clay. But every time you start your new application or your new library, you've got that same little lump of clay. And, uh, and it's kind of all up to you. So, uh, so let's see what you, know, what, what you have to do if you want to write your own module. So the first approach that, that we've kind of uh, all learned is the module pattern. Um, and this, this lets. This makes life nice for the client. Uh, it means the client can really do something as simple as a script source equals and just uh, add your library to their program and, and everything works fine for them for the most part. Uh, but for you as the library writer, there's a whole lot of bookkeeping you have to do. Um, this is kind of like the bare minimum of what you need to write a library for the browser. Uh, so to start with, oh, my highlighting isn't going to show up very well. That's all right. So to start with, you, you wrap everything in the uh, immediately uh, invoked function expression. Um, down here, we pass in the global object. This won't even work if you're trying to create something that's, uh, that's multi-environment. Uh, so you have to play even more trickery uh, to get at the window, or to get at the global object if it's not called window. Um, maybe up here, you, uh, so, yeah, down here, you actually put all your exports in an object. Up here at the top, you might save uh, a local copy of your library in case you need to refer to it during the body. And then the most miserable part is this uninstallation process that you need to do to be a good citizen. So just in case the global name that you chose is the same global name that somebody else chose, uh, or maybe you just have a, a, a user that doesn't want to trash the global namespace, and they'd like to be able to get at your library without it, trashing the namespace, you have to uh, sort of create this little, do this little dance to re restore the, uh, the global object to whatever state it was in before your library got installed. And right, right here in the middle, these three lines, that's sort of like the core of the library. That's the actual contents here. The rest of this is just boilerplate. Um, this is a huge amount of overhead that you have to pay every time you want to create a library. Um, and that's just too expensive. Uh, and just the fact that it's a pattern, um, language geeks like me, when we, when we, whenever we hear people say design pattern, it sort of sends off a, a red alarm in our head. Uh, I like this quote from Paul Graham. Uh, 
He says, I wonder if these patterns are not sometimes evidence of the human compiler at work. Uh, I don't want to be a compiler. I don't think anyone should be a compiler. I think a compiler should be a compiler. Um, so if you don't want to go through all of that pain, another choice, an another option that you have is to take some existing framework and uh, just write your, your library as a plugin for that framework. So if you are willing to uh, make the assumption that uh, your users will use jQuery, for example, uh, or that they'll have to use jQuery to use your library, you can just extend jQuery through their, uh, their plugin mechanism. Um, that's lower overhead on your part for creating a library, but it's a crappy deal that, that you just had to make, which was basically, I'm willing to restrict myself to only those users who are using this particular framework. Um, so that's no fun. Now, on the, on the server side, uh, CommonJS has really drastically improved the state of things. So uh, CommonJS is, is very much a big deal. Uh, when, you, when you write your Node.js app, it's really as simple as um, sticking it in a separate file, um, making sure it's in the right directory, and you can just say require. Um, and CommonJS is, is starting to, to pick up steam in the browser, but um, this is what it looks like uh, when you want to use a CommonJS library uh, in the browser environment. And the reason for this, of course, is because of the non-blocking I.O. in JavaScript. So, um, and we all know the, the, the pain of the nested callback issue in JavaScript. Um, uh, and, and James Burke has done a good job in Require.js of making it a little less painful because uh, you can sort of give, you can give an array of modules that you want to, to require. So maybe there's only one nested callback. But this idea that you have to um, slap this boilerplate, boilerplate around your program and nest your program into the middle there uh, is, is really just too high of an overhead, especially because now we're talking about overhead on the part of the clients. So now you're saying, if you want to use my library, you, every single one of you users of my library, you're going to have to pay this cost uh, to, to buy into it. Um, so I, th I think we, we need to be able to do better than that. And on top of that, um, there are just certain things about the semantics of JavaScript that are, that are not ideal uh, that CommonJS can't really do anything about because CommonJS um, didn't, didn't have the luxury of changing the language. So uh, when you create your separate module and you put it in a separate file, there's still nothing CommonJS can do to stop you from making a mistake and uh, assigning to a global variable. So uh, if I accidentally assign to i in, inside of my CommonJS library, uh, I'm going to create a global variable and have all the, the trouble that global variables cause. So um, this is sort of all prelude to why I think modules for JS Next are important and, and why uh, on TC39, the, the ECMAScript committee, we've, we've been working on this. So in our design, uh, creating a module is really as simple as this. Uh, you just use the, the new module keyword, you give it a name, you put a couple of braces, and then you put whatever you want inside the body. And by default, when you put a variable declaration, that variable declaration is local to the module. It's not exported. So if you want to export something with the rest of the world, you say export. So this immediately gets you away from the, the iffy, the, the immediately invoked function expression. Uh, but it's still creating that, that one global variable. And uh, I, I think the common JS approach is a good one, where you might also like to just put the contents of your module in another file, and now you don't even have to name the module. Now you can let your client just import it however they, or require your, your module however they want to. So this is sort of the equivalent of the previous slide. It's just being done in a separate file. Um, so the client now just gets to say something like this. Uh, I should say that like, none, of the, none of the syntax is absolutely set in stone, and um, uh, people like to argue about the syntax, and, and you know, we may con continue discussing the syntax, uh, but this hopefully gives you a flavor of, of what it is we're trying to do. Um, so again, we have this, this new module keyword, and the client can say, uh, I'm going to call their lib my lib, and I'm going to require it from this separate file. So notice, now you get to do external module loading from within JavaScript. No more script tag necessary. Um, this also means that it's one solution for the language that works, uh, whether it's in Node.js or in the browser or uh, in a mobile app, whatever. The next cool thing is that you can put as many of these module declarations in a row as you want without having to do any of those nested callbacks. So we're doing I.O. here. So what's the trick? How did I do this without 
avoiding blocking the whole browser? And the answer is that there's really two stages involved in, in running a JavaScript program. And this is true in all modern uh, JavaScript engines. Uh, even though it's, you know, we think of it as an interpreted language, every JavaScript engine actually has a really sophisticated compiler in it. So when JavaScript code comes into the engine, the engine actually compiles it first, um, turns it into some sort of intermediate representation or maybe into assembly. Uh, and then every time you call that code, it's, it's actually going to run the compiled code. So we want to exploit that fact that there's compilation involved. So we actually shove the I.O. portion into the compilation phase. So all of these requires are happening before any of the code starts running. And that's the trick. Uh, when you shove that into, for example, the browser, the browser can do the I.O. in a separate thread. It doesn't have to block the main uh, UI thread. So we have this compilation phase that does all of the loading in whatever order it wants on whatever threads, background threads it wants. And then we have the separate execution phase, and that's where we, once again, will enforce the sequential order of execution, like always in JavaScript. So by introducing new syntax into the language and, and extending the existing compilers, we actually will allow you to write your requires just the way you want to write them uh, without blocking the UI thread. Um, some more features of the module system. Uh, we can nest modules. So here's a module declaration inside of another file that itself is defining a module. Um, and you can refer to modules by name, just like any other binding in the language. So, so here we're just sort of treating this module like an object. And its export map is like a property of that object. So we can just refer to it as util.map. But uh, we can also get compile time checking. Again, we're, we're extending the compiler here. So we know what these modules are at compile time. The compiler can actually tell us uh, exactly what the exports of that module are. So here we're saying import util.map. Map is a variable binding. But if we misspelled map, uh, the compiler will tell us right away, before it starts running the program, you got a, you got a variable name wrong. So one of the most annoying bugs I find when I'm writing JavaScript code is uh, whenever I fat finger a variable name, I don't find out till somewhere in testing. Or if I forgot to test that particular path, I don't find out till uh, the code's already out there and running. Um, in, in Harmony and JS Next, we're actually uh, designing it so that all uh, unbound variables will give you an early error, a compile time error. And that includes uh, um, bogus imports. Uh, the other thing we can do, again, uh, exploiting this compile time information, we can say import util.star, which you know, some people think that's bad style, but for scripting, that's often just really useful. Uh, if you've got some module that has 200 exports and you want to use 120 of them and you don't want to name them all uh, by name, you can just say import that module.star. And this doesn't have all the problems that width has. So width is, uh, uh, you know, the problems of width come from the fact that it's doing dynamic variable binding. What we're doing here is completely compile time variable binding. So the compiler knows what all of those variables are. Um, another thing that uh, we are inheriting from CommonJS here is uh, the notion that uh, models that you require are singletons. So if you require the same, uh, the same module multiple times in the same program, you'll get one single instance of that module. Um, which is just, it's just what you want. Um, so those were all sort of static patterns. Uh, but of course, um, for you know, real uh, serious uh, JavaScript apps, um, you often need to be able to do dynamic or lazy or conditional loading of modules. So um, the static modules that I was showing you were sort of the simple, easy way to do the common cases. But if you want to do dynamic loading, we also have an API included in the design that lets you do, um, make dynamic decisions about requiring. And that's where you actually do have to use the callbacks. So for example, if you have some Easter egg on your site and you don't expect it to be clicked very often and you don't want everyone to pay the cost of loading the, the Easter egg module, uh, you can do you know, on click for the, the Easter egg element. Uh, you'll then make the dynamic decision to call this require method on a module loader object, which I'll talk about in a minute, give it the URL and the callback that takes the dynamically loaded module. OK, so the design accommodates both static uses of modules and dynamic uses of modules. 
Okay. Um, that's sort of the basic highlights. Um, this might get a little trippier now. Uh, I hope that's okay. I hope it's fun. Um, there's, there's something kind of lurking underneath here that gets at the heart of one of the really mind-twisting aspects of JavaScript. Um, JavaScript actually gives you this crazy ability to eval inside of your eval. Uh, I'll, I'll spare you the, um, the yo dog jokes. But um, so it, we can do things like eval of eval of eval of eval in JavaScript. And this, this might seem like a crazy parlor trick. Um, and in fact, uh, you know, there's, there's lots of people who have learned that, that we should never touch eval. Uh, eval is evil, all of those things. We've all heard it. Um, and I'm, I'm so inspired by Andrew DuPont, who, who's telling us all, relax, everything is okay, you just got to know what you're doing. Um, uh, so I, I personally don't want to see eval go away. I think eval is an incredibly powerful tool that's not always the right tool. So, you know, we all know, we've all seen these examples of ridiculous programs that use eval where they had no business doing so. Uh, you know, when you can use bracket notation, there's absolutely no reason to be using eval. Um, but that said, there's plenty of examples where I can't think of anything other than eval that will do the, tr the trick. So uh, if I want to write a little uh, command line interface for JavaScript, a little JavaScript shell, how am I going to do that without eval? Am I going to write my own JavaScript interpreter just to implement that? Uh, that seems absurd. That's exactly what eval was built for. And this, I mean, this site, you know, is maybe uh, not the most, you know, full-scale web app in the world, but there are real web apps that need to evaluate JavaScript code uh, for real serious purposes. Um, we've seen some, some awesome demos uh, yesterday uh, of, um, of the Ace Editor. Uh, of course, there's Code Mirror. Um, and when you have an IDE that somebody's editing their JavaScript code and they want to run that JavaScript code, well, that's, that's eval, right? The, the cloud-based editors are written in JavaScript. They're taking JavaScript code and running that JavaScript code. So that's an eval inside of an eval. Um, there's sort of a hidden inception inside of, of every one of these web apps. Um, but there is kind of a, a, a nuisance of that eval, which is the fact that every one of them is sort of sharing this one single global namespace. Uh, so uh, if, if I'm writing my own cloud-based IDE and I'm taking some arbitrary stranger's JavaScript code and I'm running it, I'd really rather run it inside of some sort of a sandbox so that I can make sure that their code's not accidentally going to trip up on the JavaScript code that implemented the IDE itself. Um, and if they're going to do things like hack the, the prototypes of the standard built-ins, I don't want that to mess up the, uh, the operation of the IDE itself. So I'd really like to be able to uh, kind of create these nested evals in somewhat of a more protected setting. So I showed you that uh, module loader dot require before. Uh, module loaders are actually the uh, the way that we can do nested evaluation in a more protected sandbox. A module loader is itself a, a sandbox, so it's module loaders all the way down, uh, and uh, we can take an existing loader, say parent loader, and create a new one. And we get a lot of bells and whistles where we can control exactly what that sandbox uh, does and doesn't allow, what it shares with its parent and what it doesn't. And we, can, and we can eval inside of that loader, or we can require external modules with that loader. So some of the things that these sandboxes let you do, uh, you can control the instance caching that, that uh, makes the singleton behavior work. Um, you can create custom loading behavior. So you could decide that you want to redirect load requests to some CDN or uh, to some local storage where you've been caching it. You can, you can put whatever custom behavior you want there. Uh, you can create a separate global object so that it's completely isolated from the parent loader. Uh, you can create fresh built-ins so that prototype hacking doesn't uh, interfere with each other. Uh, and you can even do compiler hooks. So you can actually add your own uh, compile time checking, like a lint tool, or you could even add your own arbitrary compilation where you can say, hey, I want a module loader that understands CoffeeScript instead of JavaScript. So uh, where we are right now, we've prototyped this in uh, a metacircular evaluator for JavaScript called Narcissus. Um, I've built the, the core module system and parts of the, the module loaders as well. 
Uh, and for the sake of demo, um, we also have an add-on for uh, Firefox called uh, Zephod that takes Narcissus and drops it in as a replacement for SpiderMonkey. Um, so uh, I'd like to do a demo just showing you a little bit of some of the kinds of cool things you can do. All right, so here, I've heard people saying they don't like live coding. I hope this isn't unpleasant. OK, so here we've got a little tiny web page. Um, uh, let's call this one Harmony. OK, so here's a little div called Harmony. Um, and just to show you that we're working with Narcissus, type equals script Narcissus. This is what Zephod does, is it lets you use this, uh, uh, sorry, application Narcissus. Right, so var element equals document. OK, so that code was actually not running through SpiderMonkey, but running through Narcissus. So, so this is actually the extended, the, the language extended with uh, the module system. Um, so one thing that I've done is, well, here, let me show you. Uh, no, let's do it like this. Script type equals application Narcissus uh, source equals coffee. So I've implemented a little module loader for CoffeeScript, and it's not the full CoffeeScript. It's just enough to demo. Um, so I could do just to show you that it really is there, uh, alert CoffeeScript. OK, so there's a module loader called CoffeeScript that I brought into scope. So I don't know if this exactly will be something we could do for HTML, but I would really love it if we could. If we could just take an existing module loader that's already been defined and say, that's the loader I want to use for this script tag. So then I could do element equals document .get element. Oh, I should create that element. OK, so there's some CoffeeScript code just embedded in my web page. And there it is. OK, and just to show you that I'm really weird, um, I've got one for Scheme as well. OK, so here's some scheme code. Define element. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Pair programming. Document dot get element by ID scheme. Set bang element dot inner HTML. Oh man. The dot should work. Let's look at my backup file and see what I did wrong. Scheme dash loader dot JS. It's always good to have a cheat sheet. There we go. All right. <laughs> OK, so as I say, I don't know if the HTML uh, extensions here are going to fly. I have not yet uh, pitched that to anybody. Um, but that's kind of my goal here, is that uh, I'd like to be able to let you write your own language extensions and then plug them directly declaratively into, into your HTML 
so that you can put whatever languages you want or whatever extensions to JavaScript you want. Um, this, of course, is going to have a performance cost. So uh, it may not always be viable in production. Um, but what it does mean is that when you're, uh, when you're in development, you don't have to run your own preprocessor on the code before you, before you can actually keep reloading. It means that um, you can do the, the more dynamic shift reload style that, that we know and love uh, for the development process. Um, OK, so that was the demo. All right, so I, I actually don't have too much more. It might run a little under, but I, I want to address head on something that you know I always hear a fair amount of angst about. Um, I, you know, I, I'm not trying to taunt you with things that uh, that you can't have tomorrow, um, but at the same time, I can't promise you that these things uh, are going to happen overnight. Um, so uh, the the life cycle of, of the standards process is long, and and it means that. Um, uh, that these things take some time, um, but but here's my plan. Th this is this is my answer to that question. Uh, I've got to work hard, and the rest of TC39 has got to work hard, and we are working hard on specking, prototyping, um, building in real browsers, uh, and then deploying. So um, we've moved at Mozilla to a, a faster release cycle that's um, more in line with the the speed of the the Chrome. Life cycle, and so we're not waiting for the full standard to come out to start deploying these features. Uh, so we're hoping to try to ship modules somewhere around Firefox 7 or so. That is not a promise, um, but uh, and Firefox 7 uh, is actually uh, scheduled to be later this year. So um, it's our hope to get this in the hands of developers as soon as, as humanly possible. Now that'll be sort of the initial release that'll you know, maybe be unstable as the standards process continues. Uh, we'll have to keep refining. Uh, you may not be able to build production code that depends on it immediately, but it does mean that you'll be able to try it out soon. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, just, just because it's, it's released in 2011 or 2012 in modern web browsers doesn't mean that every web app will be able to depend on it. Uh, because you're going to have to wait for non-modern web browsers to catch up. Uh, but there is a polyfill answer even for language extensions. And this is something that Brendan uh, mentioned just briefly yesterday, but, um, but I really want to hammer on it. Um, just sort of like I was showing with, with module loaders that we could, uh, um, you know, you could use it for development uh, as a quick um, uh, reloading process, a quick debugging process, but you could still do an offline compiler. Uh, we can do offline compilers just like CoffeeScript for uh, JS Next. And we can even do tricks like we did with Zephod uh, to let you do that in a really convenient way in development, but then you could run the preprocessor offline for, uh, for deployment. So um, my hope is that shims uh, will help, that, that people will be able to start using the new features knowing that Ultimately, the web browsers will actually have built-in support for it, but until they do, uh, they can pre-compile. Um, and I think that's going to help. But the last point, um, I hope advocacy is not a dirty word, but uh, uh, the developer community has a really strong voice. And um, what, what developers clamor for, um, browser vendors have to build. So um, if you demand it, um, that will help uh, bring the better future faster. Uh, so that's a, a, a taste of the module system. Um, I'm happy to, to dive deeper with people offline and um, happy to take any questions about uh, JS Next at all. Thanks very much. What's going on with proxies? Uh, proxies are in. Um, so proxies are uh, um, a fairly stable design at this point. Um, they're they're uh, widely liked uh, on the committee. Um, they're very, very powerful, and we can do a lot of cool things with them. And Firefox 4 is shipping with them. Uh, as I said, there may be some, some API changes, um, so it's not completely stable yet, but, uh, but you, can, you can use them today. Uh, and it's my understanding that there are Chrome developers who are interested in, in building it soon, uh, v, uh, V8 developers who are interested in building it soon, but I, I don't want to speak for them. Um, but yeah, they are, they are harmonious. They are uh, uh, agreed upon by the whole committee. So the question is, is, is an import.star dangerous because uh, names you didn't expect can get injected? Um, so import.star 
is not something that's happening at runtime, it's happening at compile time. Um, so it's not like running code can suddenly inject new things into, into the namespace. But there is, um, you know, there is somewhat of a hazard that you might, get a, you might get in scope a name that you didn't expect. However, um, part of the design of modules is that if you have a name collision where you imported the same name from multiple places, uh, it's going to give you an early error instead of um, just sort of silently picking one. Um, so somebody's not going to be able to secretly override the name uh, via import.star. Um, that said, I fully expect that there will be people building lint tools that say you shouldn't use import.star, just like they say you shouldn't use minus minus. And I think we're all grown-ups and we can, we can make those decisions for ourselves. Um, I think import.star import .star is just too useful for scripting, for rapid development, um, and uh, for cases where you know what you're doing. Um, but I certainly can understand that a development shop might decide that um, you know, their coding practices say don't use it. I know what the question is, though, is what's, what's the deal with require being a keyword? Uh, require is a contextual keyword here, not a keyword. So the module form, I should have said this, the module form is a special form, and what's on the right-hand side of the equals is not a arbitrary JavaScript expression, it's a, a, a module expression, and so it's a, a limited subgrammar, and require is only special in that context. So uh, there's no backwards compatibility issues with the syntax of require. Um, there are potentially some compatibility issues with the syntax of module. Um, first of all, I should point out that this is an opt-in new language. So, so uh, JS.next is going to be something that's not going to just get turned on by default in the browser. It's going to be something that you have to choose via a new script type. Um, so we are allowing some level of backwards incompatibility um, to try to fix things that, that, you know, that we really want to fix, that people really want fixed. Um, but we'd also like to keep the migration cost low. So we don't want too many um, you know, really unnecessary, gratuitous uh, incompatibilities. So we'll look at possible ways of finessing the module keyword to make it a little bit less incompatible. But the require keyword, there's, there's no problem. Hi, Dave. Can you talk about um, how the require system plays with, uh, with packaging systems that people are using today, where you may have many modules in a single file? Um, it's a good question. I think, I think to some degree what we're trying to do is not solve the packaging system problem and let people continue to uh, create their own packaging systems. Um, as far as, oh, oh, did you mean like, like, like bundles like that are maybe in a jar file or a zip file or something like that? So as, if it's in source form, um, you can have many modules uh, either required by one wrapper module or even just nested inside of it. But if it's in some other form like uh, .zip or .jar or something like that, um, I, I don't have any plans for anything built in, but module loaders do let you write your own custom loading semantics. So that was one of those, like, circling the sandbox. There were uh, all, all these different um, knobs that you could customize. Um, one of them is the loading semantics. You can write your own code that maybe uses some of the new binary data and, and I.O. facilities to read whatever source format you want to recognize. Um, so that's why I say we're sort of leaving that to continue to be explored by the community um, rather than trying to, to solve it here and now. But it is a very, very extensible system, so hopefully people should be able to write uh, their own uh, loaders for that. Some of that is already uh, possible with JAR URIs using the bang syntax oh, to okay. load a okay. member. So you could try to factor it out of any language's module system and into the URI and the browser's URI handling. Um, but Yeah, there's still some pieces we need to work out of the, um, the exact behavior of the, of the standard web module loader. And maybe some of that stuff we can actually just have work out of the box. And we definitely welcome feedback. Hi. Um, just wondering if you could expand a little bit more on, um, you know, common JS and AMD and the migration strategy, because the module loader lo API looked a lot like uh, the AMD mm -hmm. um, one. And, and also we have uh, plugins on AMD to uh, allow people to uh, do the either server side or client side, you know, cross compilation as well. There's CoffeeScript um, plugins as well. So did, I'm just wondering if you had any other 
um, comments about the migration strategy itself. You guys thought about that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I, I can only speak broadly because um, I have a lot more uh, to learn, um, and we have a lot more conversations left to, to be had. Um, but uh, I, I do see a place for tools, for migration tools in this. Uh, I think so much of the semantics of what we're doing um, and the semantics of modules, uh, of CommonJS modules and, and AMD are very compatible with each other that um, hopefully people should be able to continue writing with the tools that they have today and we should be able to build migration tools to help them move to that tomorrow. Oh, and I think Wes Garland has actually even started working on some of those tools. Um, but uh, as I say, there's more, there's more conversations left to have. I don't know where we are on time, but uh, yeah, I think we're just at, out of time. So yeah, I'm happy to, to talk more offline. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy trails to you until we meet again.